everyone, please come back to the room so that we can start with our next session. Everyone, please take your seats. Welcome back to the MTT Policy Forum 2024. Our next session presents reflections of selected policymakers and PIOs on the role of policy influencing organizations in water, energy, climate policy making in the Mekong region. They'll also share their experiences. Um, at this point, may I invite Ms. Kain Kim, DG Odomsak, Ajan Wee Chan, and Dr. Netra to come on stage, please. So can I have uh, Ms. Kain Kim? Please come on stage. DG Odumsak, Ajan Wichan, and then Dr. Netra. Then, um, very good, thank you. And if you can just take the seats in front. So our first um, policymaker is Dr. is Ms. Ken Kim, who is the Deputy Director General of Fisheries Administration of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries of Cambodia. And then we also have uh, Director General Odumsak Pilawong, who is the Director General of the Water Resources Department of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment of Lao PDR. And he was also the former head of the Lao National Mekong Committee. And then, our next speaker has been both the, the ultimate decision maker of two major agencies in Thailand, and he is now an influencer. So, Ajahn Wichan Simachaya was formerly the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment in Thailand, and also the previous director general of the Pollution Control Department. He is now currently the president of the Thailand Environment Institute. And then our last, but certainly not the least speaker is Dr. Eng Netra, who is the Executive Director of Cambodia Development Research Institute, Cambodia's leading independent development policy research institute. Now, may I, uh, may I start with um, Ken Kim? Can you reflect on your role working actively in managing Cambodia's fisheries sector? and the importance of up-to-date knowledge and information and decision-making. 
as well as the role of policy influencing organizations. So civil society organizations, think tanks, and research institutes, among others. And also your experiences on how to deal with senior policymakers in Cambodia. And just for the information of everyone, Ken Kim is responsible for managing Cambodia's um, incredibly rich and globally significant freshwater fisheries. In fact, Cambodia has some of the largest inland fisheries in the world. And Cambodia's inland fisheries is ranked among the top five worldwide in terms of productivity and its contributions to livelihoods and nutrition. So now, Ken Kim, over to you. Thank you very much. So uh, as the introduction already, Cambodia is the rich of fresh water uh, in Cambodia. So I would like to start, uh, share you the lesson learned, how the policy has been uh, influenced and make a response to the uh, fresh water fishery management, include marine as well. So I would like to uh, uh, share a brief, share a lesson learned and experience that we had been uh, making uh, so far from the last two decades up to currently. So as you know that uh, Cambodia had in the first uh, fishery policy reform in year 2000, which is uh, we had the large scale and small scale fishery in the Great Lake of Tun As you know, Great Lake, uh, Great Lake Tun is in the heart of the Mekong. So that is rich of the fresh water in Cambodia. And our people living along, along the Great Lake and in Cambodia depend very much on the fresh water. And then having seen the why of the small scale fisher who has conflict uh, with the large scale in the Great Lake. And this why hurt to our uh, policy maker, the, the government, and then government decide to uh, reform the policy for the fishery management in Cambodia in year 2000. So we uh, reformed the fishery management, which means that we cut off more than 50% of the large scale and give this uh, open asset to the small scale fisher. So then that, that year, it was the policy reform we reformed to consider with the small scale fisher and also we allow the uh, fisher, small scale fisher, all stakeholders involved with the government that uh, the uh, protection uh, management manage of the fishery resources for in the sustainable way with in the form of fishery co-management with its established as we call the community fishery. So we also uh, uh, formulate the legal document that uh, support the small scale fisher as the fisher group, as the community uh, fishery group. So at that time, they had, uh, we formulated the community fishery. Uh, so far, we had 516 community fishery, both inland and marine. So we spread out the experience uh, uh, with local people, uh, participation with the uh, technical agency and with the government to uh, implement the policy reform of the fishery management in Cambodia. And then, with the successful and seeing the uh, achievement of the government goal, reaching the uh, more open access for the small scale fisher, and that the poverty also has been uh, better. And then the government decided again in year 2012, uh, we call deep reform in year 2012, which means that all large scale in the Great Lake this abolished all. So now we have no, uh, no more large scale. So only small scale, and we had the form of the community fishery all in the country. And uh, we support legal document guidelines to support the uh, local community together. And also in the fishery law. Also we uh, uh, update the fishery law, which include one chapter, recognize the local participation in the uh, natural fishery resource management. And now we have a lot of experience. We're facing uh, a lot of challenges that we learn. So we, then we uh, also now, we are currently in the process to uh, uh, revising the legal framework, which is also uh, reflecting, reflecting in the 
uh, new policy reform also and also revising the legal framework of the subject of the community fishery and also the fishery law as well. And uh, this year, we, we after we implement uh, our strategic plan for two decades, it include uh, the new policy as I mentioned earlier. And then this year, we uh, formulate the 10-year uh, strategic which reflects what we are, uh, has been uh, uh, learned that look in, looking at how we can uh, uh, do better of the, uh, the local people and also for the sustainable fishery resources. So, which means that we reflect on the how not only involve local people with the conservation and protection, but also look at how we can alternate uh, option to the community fishery that they can, uh, what we call more than uh, agriculture uh, community with the new policy for uh, our ministry that both the community, the, the, the community in related with the fishery resource and also the community uh, related with the agriculture and forestry as well. So more than uh, community which means that they can do uh, protection, managing the resource, and also benefit economic growth uh, as well. So this is how we uh, reflect, and also at the same time when we are formulating, I also uh, uh, thank very much to our uh, former uh, speaker regarding with the form uh, policy formulation. So at the at the experience for Cambodia, uh, uh, the it start from the why from the problem of the fisher, and then we formulate the policy and then we implement and then we reflect uh, back again. So this is how how we are doing and also we formulate the strategic plan to respond and at the same time along the way we learn and uh, we improve the process. But please keep in mind that the policy formulation and also the recommendation from research, not only on the paper, uh, we formulate and implement action is the very important and practical way. So that's why when we are formulate the strategic and policy for our sector, we also at the same time, we cross-check with the research fund funding and recommendation, but also we cross-check and consult consultation with the local people again. So we, like we are doing the sub-degree now, revising the sub-degree, we consultation with the local people but from the ground and uh, at the provincial level and regional level and national level. So then we finalize. So this is how we work. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So Kim, in, in, in the revision that you're planning, you've demonstrated that you actually also consult researchers, right? Policy influencers to help you plan the revision? Yes. We, we under the, uh, our organization, we had the so two research institutes, marine and freshwater. So they are key very important role to monitor and study and research with related with the sector, both inland and marine. So when we are doing planning and policy, we look at that their recommendation, when, but at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, we also go back to the local people to do uh, consultation as well. Can you share also your experiences having to communicate to a higher policy levels in the country? Yes, because as I want all the focal point at the council minister that uh, attendingly we had to report. Uh, now we report weekly our sector, fishery sector, the statistics and the problem face uh, to our higher level, our minister and our prime minister, and also monthly meeting with the Council uh, for Social, Economic, and uh, Culture. I am attend monthly meeting as well. So the fishery sector also present uh, in the report, and then we discuss what are the problems in that. And also uh, the research result and also our monitoring result is the best evidence uh, knowledge and uh, uh, situation our sector that report to higher level. Thank you very much, Kim. Now let's um, go to Laos, to DG Odumsak. Um, 
Can you reflect on your experiences dealing with various organizations providing data and information to help your department manage a transboundary river basin? And also, can you speak about the challenges and opportunities of data sharing? And also, if you have other reflections on the role of policy influencers. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, uh, thanks for uh, give me opportunity to uh, provide our, the, the role of the uh, Department of Water Resources of Lao PDR is uh, imp uh, implementation and uh, management of uh, project, program, and also the monitoring of uh, water quality, water quantity of both uh, surface water and ground water in, uh, in Lao PDR. As uh, you, you may be uh, aware that uh, Lao PDR is the, the country in the central of uh, Southeast Asia. So all of our rivers are transboundary. We have 90% of our uh, uh, river, which is a part of the Mekong system, and the other 10% of the territory flows uh, uh, between uh, Laos and Vietnam borders. So everything, every development in, uh, involved in Laos PDR uh, reflects and, and, and uh, impacts to uh, other neighboring countries. So the, the, the role of a uh, department of water resources, uh, especially we are the, the, the one who manage the, the river, we have uh, di different uh, sectors, like uh, especially the most influential maybe the uh, hydropower, and we have uh, the traditional uh, uh, departments and, and, and ministers like uh, uh, we have uh, uh, water supply, we have fisheries, we have uh, irrigation, all are these uh, uh, water users. And what, what happens when, when we receive the data? I can give the, uh, the most recent uh, event. Two weeks ago, it was the, two, three weeks ago, it was a, a, a storm, Yagi, that flows uh, in the northern part of Laos. Uh, be, before that, we, we got already the information and we already uh, sitting and, and and giving the information to, to the uh, uh, social society and, and those who will be impacted. But uh, while we, we inform, but the government and the official uh, data always behind the, uh, the unofficial and fake news, or what I can say. And uh, be because we, we work and we analyze the data, it takes some time. But the social media just got the, the information from, from somewhere and put on the social media. And what happens that uh, when the, uh, the, uh, the flood happens, people start to blame about the, uh, the infrastructure above and, 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 and beyond and around that area. And, and we try to, we, we don't say that we, we protect or we, uh, uh, we, we do other things just to, to say the fact, what happens in, in reality, and we give the information to, uh, uh, to our uh, policy makers. And, and partly I am, I am part of the policy making group also in uh, water resources. So because uh, our river, because we are very important for the Mekong River. 35% of our territory is aligned within the, the uh, Mekong Basin, and roughly 40% of the Mekong flows is from, from Laos. Mm -hmm. and, and, and our other downstream neighbors may also uh, uh, give or, or, or have uh, some uh, negative view of something happens from the, uh, the management of our water resources in Laos. So, so uh, in, in brief, so we are monitoring, but to make the, uh, uh, the society believe and trust, we need to, to make the trust building 
by providing the, the real information and share the data. And, and, and we, are, we are working hard to try to improve how can we work faster. I mean, we always uh, run behind the, uh, the fake news. And, 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 and we hope that in the new uh, paradigm and the new uh, uh, operations uh, 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 modality, we, we work and, and provide a more timely information to the society. Uh, this is a, a, a rough uh, information uh, from my department. Thank you. Thank you very much, DG Odumsak. You, you spoke about the importance of um, real-time research-based information, right? So that you are going to prevent fake news from taking root. Now, can I just ask, how do you build trust on the information that you have provided? How do you enable the different stakeholders, users of your information, to believe that your information is trustworthy? Uh, the, the, the way we are, we are doing, we, we have the, uh, the analysis of the real data. And, and those uh, information is uh, also, whenever we go to, uh, to, the, uh, to the ground level, and then we, we come down with uh, the, uh, the staff or the local uh, mm -hmm. representative, representative of a local, a local uh, uh, communities uh, to, to see what, what really ha happened. But again, I, I would like to say that we need to, to work faster. Mm. Uh, with, the, with the new uh, uh, emerging uh, technology like uh, AI mm. or, or in better information technology, we try to improve. But but other ways, we also try to, uh, uh, to, to make the, uh, the people understand that if you listen to the fake news, mm. uh, sometimes uh, people, uh, it makes the problem in the society rather than to, to make the real uh, solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, uh, DJ Odumsak. So what you're saying is that not only making your information available faster, but also working with the communities, with your users, alongside with them, so that you know what kind of information you will provide with them, okay? Thank you very much with that one. Now, may I proceed with um, Ajahn Wichan Simat Chaya. Being at some point in your professional lives, you were the ones being influenced by different kinds of information. Now you're on the other side, trying to influence people like you previously. What's your reflection on this? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's my case pleasure to be here uh, to share uh, my knowledge, uh, Italian. Uh, I myself used to be a, a researcher before and then become to a uh, decision maker, but right now uh, I do both researcher and uh, decision maker. Kunakus uh, uh, can help, uh, can I help my uh, uh, short uh, PowerPoint presentation? Uh, next piece. Yeah, I'm I, uh, going to talk about what, what is the, the uh, challenge. Uh, when we talk about the water, uh, energy, and the climate change is a cost-cutting issue. We have to work uh, various agencies uh, in uh, the country, even in the region. Uh, the challenge is cooperation. I think it's very important. We have to work with the community, with civil society, uh, private sector, uh, local uh, authority, especially uh, in, in our country, local authority, they have money, but how we, we can get them in, uh, involved, I think it's very important. Uh, we talk about the next uh, water, energy, food, even the uh, climate also uh, cost cutting issue. Many agencies, uh, related to that kind of issue, how uh, be, being all agency work together, I think it's very important. Uh, working uh, on the ground, implementation, also very important, especially when we implement something, uh, we have to come up with the uh, policy uh, recommendation. And the important thing, when we talk about the research, uh, 
research this means scientific information how we translate scientific information in uh, uh, into the public in general into the decision making i think it's very important we have to make it simple for them uh, that that uh, kind of thing uh, policy have to get involved especially for the uh, early stage of the uh, researcher in Thailand right now, I myself also taking care of uh, uh, environmental issue under National Research uh, Council. Also, when we are going to uh, support the researcher, uh, we have to ask the researcher to bring the right agency to work uh, uh, with them at the early stage. And then the agency have to make commitment uh, what the, the uh, agency need the researcher for uh, policy development for implementation uh, something like that's really important issue as well uh, experience for uh, uh, various uh, relevant uh, forum I think is really important here we talk about the side policy uh, into action I think important especially uh, when we are going to uh, support to the uh, policy maker, we have to make it like a, a practical for them and the uh, skill and knowledge uh, should be updated. Uh, climate change is the uh, emerging issue. For example, right now, uh, Thailand uh, facing with the uh, flooding in northern part of Thailand. Uh, the research have to look for not just only the single problem, not just only water, but uh, we have to look for the whole watershed area, uh, work with the uh, cultural uh, people that uh, agriculture activity in uh, up uh, steam uh, area or something like that. That kind of thing have to, to uh, make it uh, change. The data information, uh, DG Ulomsak uh, just mentioned uh, uh, earlier, I think uh, the uh, the good thing. Next, please. Uh, I just give you some example. The project that uh, we work uh, with various uh, uh, agency. For example, the first one is uh, ecosystem-based adaptation. That's that's new issue, uh, especially for the ecosystem-based adaptation related to the water sector that uh, sponsored by. Uh, a GIZ and so bring the uh, new uh, 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 issue uh, to the uh, water management. At the early stage, it's really uh, difficult how we translate uh, EBA uh, to the engineer people. I think quite take a long time, uh, especially uh, when we talk about ecosystem, something like that. Engineer, they're not aware of the whole system approach. That's the kind of thing. Knowledge, I think, is really important. Uh, another project uh, that we work on the transboundary issue is transboundary in, in nature. We have uh, uh, to work together in the uh, country. Uh, for example, PM 2.5. Right now, we got the uh, support from uh, government uh, to work uh, with uh, uh, Lao, Pia, Myanmar. Uh, this year, we are going to include Cambodia as uh, a member uh, to uh, share the knowledge, to share uh, experience, research on the ground, especially implementation of the uh, agricultural practice with no uh, burning, that uh, kind of thing. And let's learn uh, uh, from the uh, industrial development also in the Mataput area, what we have learned uh, so far from, from Mataput industrial estate area, why uh, Vietnamese uh, still uh, develop petrochemical. Let's learn from us uh, to share uh, with the uh, Vietnamese that's uh, uh, support by uh, Japanese government. That's kind of thing. And, uh, Right now, we also work on the issue, what we call PES, Payment for Ecological, Ecological Service. I think it's a really important issue uh, as well. How uh, the people, especially in the city, uh, you can look back to uh, Chiang Mai. Uh, they pay for the people that uh, they uh, conserve 
the uh, forest in upstream area, how we can have uh, like an economic instrument for the uh, payment uh, for ecological service. That that uh, kind of thing. Next please. Uh, here is the, the project we call strengthening urban uh, climate uh, governance uh, for uh, inclusive, uh, resilient, and sustainable uh, uh, society in Thailand. This uh, similar to what we we talk uh, today is uh, uh, we develop uh, learning and training. Uh, people have uh, to understand, especially for the climate change impact, how we adapt to community research. Uh, and uh, practical research. Also, uh, not just only our, our organization, we work closely uh, with the uh, uh, institution uh, in the uh, uh, local uh, community. Uh, that's uh, Ajahn also uh, here with us, uh, also work for the uh, Konkan uh, area. This is the uh, kind of thing and link uh, the uh, knowledge and the outcome from the research to the policy, especially for the for the provincial uh, level, they have uh, like uh, the plan for for the province. This is the example uh, of the knowledge to the uh, policy influence. Next, next is here. Yeah, just uh, give you example that you talk about the side policy that the, the project uh, created by uh, myself uh, a long time ago, but still valid. Uh, especially, uh, uh, I developed because using the modeling as a tool for management, if we can reduce like, the waste load from various sectors, and then uh, uh, the water quality in the Tajin uh, River can meet the, our national standard. The Tajin River flow via the uh, flow province uh, in, in Thailand, China, uh, Supanburi, <laughs> upstream area, Nakhon Patom, and uh, Sabut Sakhon in uh, downstream. Each uh, uh, site, uh, we have various uh, problems for the upstream area, actually for the agricultural area, for pet design application, fertilizer, or something like that. In Supanburi, we have problem with the like uh, uh, fishing uh, pond in Nakhon Patom, pig farm in Sabut Sakhon, uh, uh, industrial weight, and something like that. And then uh, we uh, asked the governor to come together uh, to sign the uh, memorandum of understanding to work together as a, uh, a basin as a whole. At the same time, we also SME uh, because civil society uh, for each uh, problem to work uh, along with the uh, government sector and they can uh, take a look what what the progress we also develop the indicator for the success of implementation of the uh, action plan of the river for example we use uh, we call bio indicator that's easy for them to understand if the uh, water quality improve, they have something come back. For example, shim in uh, the drought seam area, that's the uh, kind of thing. This is the example uh, to bring the research into policy and implementation. But uh, this kind of thing is not that easy. It's depend on uh, your position. My position serves as similar to you, as uh, secretary we can submit that information to the uh, committee. And opportunity, if the government listen to you, it's okay, we, our policy can develop. Mm -hmm. Somehow they even listen to, to uh, the researcher. The important thing is to uh, translate research information into the, uh, into the public, into the decision maker in the very simple blankets. I good. Think it's really very important. good point, Ajahn. Thank you very much. So the important message that you raised there is that ensuring that the information being provided by researchers, knowledge producers, is accessible and understandable to policymakers. So thanks a lot for that. Now, um, 
Can I also invite other uh, friends and colleagues? If you have other reflections, so if you notice there are three chairs at the end, if you can also take those chairs and also share your reflection at some point. So, so that to ensure that I won't be able to forget you if you want to take those chairs now, you're welcome. Go ahead, uh, Ajahn Surian, take one of those chairs. If there's others who would like to join Ajahn Surian, you're welcome. Now, may I ask um, Dr. Netra, being the executive director of Cambodia Development Research Institute, who is a policy influencing organization in Cambodia, can you share your experiences on, on what works in terms of policy influencing and also what did not work? And also, can you reflect on your role as a wo woman in leadership position in Cambodia? Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I'm very uh, happy to be here. I'm Netra, I'm from Cambodia. So I think basically he throw three questions. I will try, and I think we already learned a lot from this morning session as well as the three uh, panel speaker, I try not to repeat uh, the point being made. I think we do have uh, similar uh, lesson learned, but also uh, possibly opportunity and challenges. From Cambodia, uh, especially from CDI perspective, uh, what I'd like to maybe say at the outline uh, before I say anything further is that we were set up by the Cambodian government back uh, after uh, the Paris Peace Agreement, if you're familiar with Cambodian history. Uh, although uh, we very clearly outlined that we are an independent development policy research institute in Cambodia, but set up by the Cambodian government. And uh, we manage our own business as we see fit with an independent board of governor. So what it means, that's a few things, and that's very important when we talk about policy engagement, policy influencing in Cambodia or in this region, is that we already established quite a long-standing trusted relationship with the Cambodian policy maker, uh, both uh, in government and outside government, and we have been in uh, operation for more than 30 years as a Cambodian-led research institution. And this has enabled, facilitate a lot of the kind of uh, opportunity that I would imagine other kind of non-state civil society organization in Cambodia or other places might have, uh, 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 you know, experience in terms of accessing, in terms of uh, uh, influencing and engaging with the policy maker uh, in Cambodia or in the region. The important lesson we learned uh, in Cambodia so far has been that for us, in order to be uh, able to engage, to influence, whether through co-creation, whether uh, at the various stages of the policy cycle uh, outlined by professor in the early Faces. The, the, the one uh, lesson I learned uh, as I've been with CDI for uh, about 20 years now, also starting as a researcher until only recently as the executive director, is that you really need to have a very uh, credible, uh, credible uh, sources of information. And that credible sources of information is evidence of knowledge whether uh, on topic that are sensitive or not sensitive, it's, it's, it's essential. And credibility does not just come from scientific rigorous uh, method, right? It credibility also coming from who fund the program. Credibility can also come from who actually part of the research team. Credibility can also come from who actually, you know, you've been engaging throughout the development of your research questions and also, you know, have validating. So we learned the hard way through kind of strengthening uh, our work so that whatever we present is not only scientific and rigorous objective uh, and product, but that the relevant stakeholder 
at the national, local, sub-national level, and a wider community actually see and believe in the value uh, of, of what we're doing. So that's uh, uh, what we are trying to do. The second thing for us is that uh, we kind of sometimes not only uh, be on uh, reactive, you know, because research also can be very slow, very reactive. You're not uh, actually giving the kind of uh, future, the kind of forward-looking agenda, and that's at CDI, we're trying to do a bit both. And, and this kind of uh, setting the agenda ourselves, uh, telling the government what they should be thinking before they even start thinking about it, could also be uh, appreciated. And that's when you get involved at a very stage when, when this agenda starts to kind of uh, buy, get buy-in from the relevant policy maker and then you get developed into this cycle of policy making. And at CDI, we've been also both, can be also part of uh, a lot of the drafting process, the inside of the policy making, so you're part of, you know, what, what to do, what to put, providing either background paper, providing uh, input to the draft version of different policies and, and law, but we also could be uh, outsider, uh, and, and, and both, uh, both uh, uh, roles are very important too, because you do need at time on different topics, depends on the stakeholder, depends on who you're working with, you can be part of the process where you actually providing real input, bringing your long-standing uh, knowledge of the topic to actually you know, making sure that the uh, that different policies and strategies and law reflect what the different stakeholder, uh, this kind of uh, intersectionalities or, or jetsy aspect into the different version. But you also could be an outsider sometime where you providing something that is more critical and may not be uh, uh, may not all the time be. Accepted. But it's important too. It's, it's an agenda setting again to, to what may not be part of, uh, uh, of the policy narrative. So those are a few things that uh, we learn uh, a lot and, and, and do it uh, as, as we see is uh, fit. The last point uh, I would like uh, to make around this is that a long-term relationship is also really important in this kind of work. And doesn't mean uh, only me as the executive director of the institute that we have to uh, make sure we develop those uh, dynamic and relationship with the different policy maker, but that our institute as a whole, our staff also working on similar topics and, and stakeholder over long term. And when there's time come, when there are emerging opportunity, we call policy, and influencing policy does not open up every day. So when time comes, that's when your experience, your relationship, and your knowledge fit in really nicely. And that's when it comes to this simple, practical, and timely intervention. It does not all the way involve new research, but it is that, you know, uh, a longer term uh, a knowledge, longer term relationship that's gonna make a big difference. What this mean in terms of support from international organization and donor to organization like us as a local national research institution is that when you work with us, please consider working with us on a longer term because policy influence, policy engagement, and this trust and relationship building need a lot of time. If you only think about engaging with CDI on a three month or six month or one year basis, those kind of important uh, influence will be uh, lost. So that, that would be uh, my kind of messages. I Thank don't know, I, I had time to address the last point because uh, maybe let the Q&A. Okay, um, but I'd like you to, is there something that you can, in, in, in not so many words, is there something that you can say about the last question? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I can reflect from uh, others, uh, female uh, uh, leaders in this room too, I think we might. 
uh, definitely uh, have a long conversations about the kind of opportunity challenges we have as a female uh, leaders in any kind of role. Uh, but at the same time, I guess uh, the respect and the credibility and also this kind of commitment, commitment to, to your work is, is also very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Netra. So if there's, I think, three words that you would like to remember from what you said, be simple, practical, and offer timely intervention. Just a curiosity, in maybe in one or two sentences, how do you then maintain your independence as a, a research policy organization? It's definitely a fine line to walk. And if you know Cambodia, that's also uh, even more challenging. Uh, personally, I've been a researcher, and the kind of topic I've been working on also is particularly uh, challenging. But as I said again, I think it's that uh, relationship, you know, because I do not just do international peer review publication. I do a lot of policy work for the policy maker, uh, lending my knowledge, expertise, or whatever I have uh, throughout the year that we have been collecting from community. And those are the kind of uh, knowledge that uh, policy makers sometimes do not have, and that is highly uh, and very much appreciated because you, you can actually you know, translate or in a way, uh, uh, the word that uh, some of the speaker used, the medi mediator, mm. but it's not mediator just to kind of relay the message, but you speak the language of the national level policy maker, and then the language of the ordinary communities or uh, people you are meeting, so that the kind of needs, the gap that usually is very big, can kind of somehow uh, be uh, uh, reduced. And that may be also very missing, because if you speak of the kind of scientific language and peer review in the National Journal of Publication, that I think is a different audience. But uh, for us as a Cambodian research institution, is that we have to play this kind of multiple uh, role, and that the local uh, knowledge uh, uh, local knowledge, local information, and bringing that in a way that policy maker can see is not just for the sake of advocating a certain political agenda that is highly appreciated. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the kind of independent uh, mm -hmm. uh, information we provided. Thanks, Dr. Nitra. So w one of the things that I got there is that maintaining relationship with your policy stakeholders, with also with the communities, is really an important ingredient, right, in maintaining your independence. So now we have two friends who would like to also reflect on, on what just been discussed and maybe offer some ways forward. So I, I try to, I did him here, but I, I, I will try to. So we have Ajahn Surya and we have also Karen. So in maybe two or three minutes, Thank you, Albert, and I would like to thank uh, the, uh, the panelists. Uh, first, I would like to extend thanks to uh, SEI and also the, the, the network. You know, it's, it has been always uh, exciting and uh, uh, a new learning every time I attend uh, the forum. Um, the input from the panel uh, demonstrated a highly dynamic ways of understanding, interpreting the role of PIOs. And for this, this is how we need to mutually learn from each other. Uh, I have three points, quick points. The first one is that when we are talking about water, energy, and climate, and uh, we want to discuss about Jesse and so on and so forth, perhaps uh, we need also to understand that we are discussing this in a more broader foundation of sustainable development, where we still do not lose sight of uh, economic viability, social responsibility, environmental responsibility, and put this as on top to really ensure that we achieve the goal we want. To be able to do this, I think I would like to emphasize uh, 
a uh, few other topics. One is that um, at the end of the day, it is important, all the sector important, but the interaction among the sector in identifying issue challenges and trade-off and how they jointly identify a solution that minimize trade-off, not shifting the problems to other sector, this is what something we need to look at. No. So I hope that this is kept at the back of the mind. So equally important is not only individu uh, addressing individual water, energy, and climate sector, but the term nexus, meaning to say there should be research and capacity to understand how nexus will be put into works. And once we are successful in doing this, we can apply also beyond water, energy, and climate. We can also include food, we can include public health, we can include urban, uh, rural uh, interfacing. So Nexus is a new research and capacity topic where we need to work. So the second quick point is about, I would like to cite the uh, presentation of uh, Dr. Uh, Piamon, uh, uh, if I uh, mentioned her. Uh, Piamon. Yes. So linking research knowledge to policy is only the tip of the iceberg. There's much more to look at in terms of policy-making processes. There is no single policy maker where we can walk directly, talk to the person, person listen, and then translate it into policy. This is involving a really a black, a back, a black box of policy-making processes. That is only half of the story. Policy implementation is another type Another story that we often overlook, and this is why we want to ensure to connect the local initiative stakeholder because eventually they are the one who actually implement the policy. And this, to me, and a strong advocate, we need to keep in mind when talking to policymaker involving those who implement your policy is to ensure half of the success. Okay. My last point is about we need to define research and capacity for future of Mekong. We are talking about Nexus, we are talking about important sector, uh, linking knowledge to policy and translate knowledge to actions. So in order to do this, I think we need to look at how we can use our networks much more better. Here, I still want to advocate about convergence of Sumanet and MTT. On one hand, has a strong research, another one is about leadership, you combine both, this is where we can get the most out of the networks. So this is one. Second is about aligning support from PIO and development partners. Eventually, they will not make uh, so much progress if we still try to pull a different stream. I think they need our collective coordinated support. And last but not least, this lies in how the network would like to evolve itself in the future. Thank you. So, Ajahn Suryan, what you're saying is a call for a, a new kind of partnership. Is that what you're saying? A much more ambitious and maybe much more inclusive partnership. I think we need to look at more practical way. And by starting a practical approach is that we need to align among ourselves. You know, we have already existing partnership, but we need to align in terms of purpose and goal. And here we expand partnership, bring more like-minded partners to make sure that we provide enough support so that the network can run and sustain its contribution. Thanks, Thank Ajahn Surian. Karen, what's your reflection on all this conversation, especially if you can see it from the perspective of inclusion? Great. Thank you, Albert. And thank you to our panelists. I feel that you have all been incredibly generous in sharing almost your worldview with us and how you see um, within the challenges that we're facing, these, these, these massive challenges, <laughs> uh, where there, there are some policy entry points and in impact points, so I just want to start by thanking you. The, the point that I was really picking up from all of your presentations was that, you know, protecting, we want to protect policy integrity, and we want to protect credibility. And there is a lot of uh, information that's being made available, and some of that information can lead to pitfalls as was discussed. And I think given AI and its relevance as it emerges in the information space, creating an even more complex uh, amount of input, I think that's something really to consider and be aware of. I, I'd actually like to take this opportunity to pose the question back to you, and I go back to Ajahn Pichamon's uh, presentation as well, really thinking about you know, how do we bring the intersectionally marginalized perspectives 
into the stages of the policy cycle? And how do we do this in a way that protects credibility and integrity, realizing that there are different types of, in, of credibility and integrity that operate across the space and across the policy cycle? I'm wondering if any of you might have an opportunity just to share a quick reflection on this point. Particularly for MTT, I know there is the necessity of building relationships and that takes time, but we've also talked about these massive challenges and the tight timelines that we're operating within. Do you see any entry points for navigating this complex space? Thank you. So Karen, what you're asking is that, correct me if I'm wrong the way I summarize the question, is that you want them to respond how to make policy making cycle much more intersectional. Is that the intention or? I'm, I'm looking for particularly entry points for what MTT are, for entry, yeah, within okay. this policy cycle for the most intersectionally marginalized voices to take, to have their, their perspectives take a, a stronger, I guess, stance within this. Okay, so entry points within MTT. So before I, I, I give you the chance to respond to that question, can I just ask if there are questions on the floor? I know um, Nyan is not going to be happy with me because we're over time, but I think the conversation is really good that we shouldn't park it until uh, a later date. And also, Kunklumjit and Buripat, are there questions online or in Hoover? Nothing so far. They're having a conversation <laughs> online. Yeah, but, can you share what they're talking the about? One, one, question, one question was, uh, can you please share uh, pathways? And one person commented, it could be bottom up for impact, bottom to top. And i um, asking if uh, you have any thoughts on that. Okay, that's very good. So pathways or entry points in the context of MTT. Now, we're really pressed for time because otherwise everyone wouldn't be able to have their lunch on time. So in, in a minute or maybe two, can you respond to that question by Karen on entry points or possibly pathways? Yeah. Go ahead. Anyone, anyone can, you can, you can jump in if you want okay, immediately. Thank you. I, I, can, uh, I can start for that. Actually, I already talked to Dr. Shianit uh, on and also MTT meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, to link the uh, MTT with uh, Summonet, I think it's very important issue. Uh, Summonet is the pool of researchers work mm -hmm. together, how uh, we bring the uh, uh, output or outcome from uh, Summonet to the uh, MTT uh, through that, uh, especially for the uh, uh, PAO, I think it's very important issue. If we have very clear channel that we can uh, work together, I think we can we can go. Let's learn from country can be shared to other uh, uh, as well. Uh, this kind of thing, if we can can have like a platform uh, to share uh, experience. Uh, Ajahn, can you be much more specific? So Karen was asking about marginalized groups and communities. So in that sharing or linking between uh, SummerNet and MTT, what do you think are the opportunities? Uh, the the opportunity, I think, is, uh, uh, I think the SummerNet already worked for a bit long. Uh, mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm cannot remember how many years. Yeah. A lot of information already provided if mm -hmm. we can have like a, a, a analyze or uh, even a synergy uh, of the input from some of it and input to MBT, I think mm. would be would be good for for us uh, to start, not just uh, maybe start one again and one again. Okay. Yeah, a lot of things in the yeah. uh, Mac home, but how? So how the entry point that you're interested in is a much a stronger link or partnership between SummerNet yeah. and MTT. Anyone who would like to come next, DJ Odomsak? Uh, I, I would like to uh, to share my my point uh, uh, of view on this. I think the uh, the result of the re of the research sometimes is is very academic. It's too too hard for uh, the the people on the ground to understand. And and many of the good research are not in Lao language in, in our local language. Mm. And even it's translated in our local language, 
is still in academic language. Mm. So it, we need uh, two times of uh, uh, two step of uh, mm. uh, 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 translation. One is from English to Lao, and then from Lao academic <laughs> language, language to to understandable to, language. Yes, to mm. to the real life language. Mm. I think this is uh, the the key points that we have to to mm. work with. Uh, that to, to make the, the, uh, the research to the real uh, policy making and, and, and very, really effective. So, in other words, what you're saying, it's not just a question of translation, but simplifying the language of communication so that it becomes effective as well. Yes, that's correct. Good. Dr. Nitra or Kim, anything else that you'd like to add? Very quickly, because um, everyone is quite looking forward to a buffet lunch. Yes, thank you very much. So, uh, I give the uh, lesson learned from us. We also, I think yesterday you also heard about the uh, village, uh, my village, that the development partner involved in Cambodia, and also as I speak earlier, the community yeah. in Cambodia, we also has the kind of the, uh, uh, their action in the plan. So uh, we are doing uh, for the research and also for the monitoring uh, activity, we also involve them in the doing their work. So it's a platform that involving the local people and to the, from the local to the uh, national and then bring up and the, the language and also the uh, make them understand what we are doing, why we do that. Not only disturb their time, because sometimes they also boring us as well, because they said that the best of time to answer our question, our research question. Mm. And then what are the actions to address their issue? So is, that is the important. So that's why we involve them from the beginning uh, to uh, answer our research question and make it simple and put in the uh, action plan and practice with them. So getting the result. So it, it means that uh, the research process with them, take action, implementation, the policy, and then present their, see their result, tangible output with them. So this is the effective way to bring them. And also the, uh, more of the time, uh, because the, uh, my organization, my, as my organization, we have the research institute, and also uh, we're doing both way, the scientific research, and also join with our development partner as well. So we do both, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, scientific research and also the local knowledge, and translate in the simple way, and then address uh, the issue and uh, work together. Thanks. Um, last but certainly not the least, uh, Dr. Netra. I don't have to say much. Uh, I mean, maybe we could uh, invest more time and resource engaging uh, the affected or mm. uh, community or the, the grassroots uh, could be uh, community fishery uh, in mm. her case and others to actually train them to provide us a, mo a lot more regular data and information, and then in return we help them to kind of know how to analyze those and present them in way that they can interact directly with whoever they come into interaction so they do have a more important role than us at this very elitist level to do all the job. I think we, we need to invest more time resources for the local communities and CBO to do more of that role. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what you're saying is that we need to engage meaningfully with those vulnerable groups and communities, and also for policymakers or researchers to communicate simply and effectively so that they're understood. And also we have to think, Ajahn Suryan, about convergence of all of these different programs. So with that, can we give our panel a big round of applause for an interesting conversation that we have? Certainly, this is at the end of the conversation. In the afternoon, we will have more opportunities for you to discuss with one another. So for now, let's break for lunch. Lunch is downstairs at, uh, what's the name of at that restaurant, buffet restaurant downstairs? Let's follow the crowd. You would know where to go. And then we would have an hour. And then five minutes to the hour, you will get a bell. 
no, we'll get around, um, so it's now 12.25, so let's come back around 1.30. And then, but you will be warned at around 1.25 to start coming back, all right? Enjoy your lunch, everyone. <laughs>